We have been asked <laughs> for this video since... oh. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm Derica, and you're watching City Studying. To learn to grow and brew, and to take control of your food, hit subscribe now. And look at the links in the description below to find where else you can find us, such as Facebook and Patreon. The day has finally come. We have been asked for this video since, oh, since we changed to using this side of the kitchen for filming. It got put on the list by <laughs> Russell Harrison and like but I know a lot hundred <laughs> plus more people. I know a lot more people asked for it. Um, so what we decided to do is Christmas is coming. A lot of people in our group and a lot of people on our channel are whiskey drinkers and appreciate whiskey. So we thought we'd do like, not necessarily a buyer's guide, but a little introduction to what whiskey is, what the different types are, and what our favorites are. And then we're gonna drink some whiskey because um, I got nine bottles sitting in front of me. There's no way I'm not drinking something. Also, some of these bottles we bought just to do this video and I haven't even opened them yet. So yeah, anyhow. What is whiskey? That's a good question. First off, whiskey is one of the products that I cannot make at home because it's illegal. And I don't care what anybody says about what their state. The federal laws in the U.S. say it's illegal to distill in the home without a permit. So it's illegal and a statement. The rest of this is going to be a positive conversation. <sighs> what is whiskey? It is... Basically, you take a mash, which is going to be any barley or corn or, or grains of any type, and you ferment that, and you make a beer, so to speak, without hops, okay? And then that is distilled, which means everything but the alcohol is removed. Well, as much of everything as they can get. You never get pure. Is removed, and what is left is alcohol. That is then aged. That's the trick to whiskey. If you don't age it, it's kind of a vodka or a rum, but it's really nothing. It's just, it's moonshine at that point. Some people will call it white whiskey. White whiskey. Now the reason why white whiskey exists, I just got to let you in on a little secret, is when a distillery starts up. Generally speaking, whiskey has to be aged for a number of years in order to become whiskey. But in the meantime, they want to sell stuff. So they coined white whiskey, so they have a product to sell. Does that make it bad? No, it's just different. It has a rough semblance of whiskey, but it's not really the same thing. The essence of what makes whiskey whiskey is the wood it's aged in, and it's usually oak, okay? American oak and French oak are the two biggest ones. Um, so that's what whiskey is. It's basically a mash, fermented, distilled, and aged in wood. So, as there are in many things in life, whiskey is the larger picture. Oh, yeah. Within whiskey, there are subsets. <laughs> Scotch mm -hmm. is a type of whiskey. Mm -hmm. Bourbon is a type of whiskey. I actually had somebody tell me on the channel, bourbon is not whiskey. No, actually, yeah, it really is. There is also... Um, Japanese, Canadian, Irish, Irish, Indian. There's a lot. A lot of different countries are now making whiskeys. The biggest ones, really, though, are still American whiskey, bourbon, um, scotch, and Irish whiskey. And those are pretty distinct flavors, and that's what we're going to go through today. We actually have those exact types. And even in those subcategories of whiskey, subcategories. there are more subcategories. We'll talk about those, um, some of them. So let's start at home, shall we? Oh, we're going to start with For them. us, home is the United States of America, and so we're going to talk about bourbon. Bourbon and American whiskey. Now, the differences between bourbon and American whiskey are pretty subtle in some cases, and in some cases, it's just in the name, because there are companies that don't want to be called bourbon, even though they technically make bourbon. But to be a bourbon, an actual bourbon, it has to be produced in the United States. Okay, so you're not going to ever get a Canadian bourbon or an English bourbon. It's, it, it's not bourbon. You can have a bourbon-like product, but it's not actually bourbon. Um, it must be made from minimum 51% corn in the mash. What that means is you can have rye, you can have barley, but it has to be 51% corn. 
corn in the mash. That's what makes bourbon taste so sweet because it is a sweeter whiskey compared to the barley only of like your single malts and stuff like that. Um, it has to be distilled at no higher than 160 proof, with, which means it's 80% alcohol max. So there's 20% other stuff. The other stuff is various oils, various other types of alcohols, as well as water because you just don't get it pure. It must be aged in new charred oak barrels and put in those barrels at no more than 125 proof. And yes, if you see me looking down, I'm reading from notes. This is a lot of stuff to know. I know most of it. Must be a minimum of 80 proof at bottling. And that's actually universal for whiskey from Canada, United States, and Europe. There are other countries um, like Thailand and places like that, Indonesia, that allow 60%, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but I know there's other places that it can be less than 80. But for most whiskey, it has to be 80. Um, for bourbon to be designated straight bourbon whiskey, which you'll see that a lot, um, Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, wild turkey, for example, must have aged in new charred oak barrels for at least two years, okay? Um, bourbon classified as bottled and bond. That's a whole other thing. That came about because whiskey in, back in the day in the United States wasn't always really whiskey. It could have been turpentine. It could have been all kinds of nasty stuff just put in bottles and sold to people as whiskey. So they, the government came up with this bottled and bond program where they actually had access to where it was being stored. And it must have been made during a single distilling season, which is important because most bourbons actually are blends um, of their own bourbons or other bourbons, but it could be blended bourbon. That's a whole other thing. I'm not going to go that far, but a lot of times they do blend different years together to keep the same flavor profile. More on that about other things too. Um, they kept it in a federally bonded warehouse for a period of at least four years. So right off the bat, it's aged twice as long. It's four years versus minimum two years for bourbon. And it has to be bottled at a hundred proof as originally defined in the Bottle and Bond Act of 1897. Only American whiskeys can carry a label of bottled and bond, and any such bourbon label must identify the distillery from which it was distilled and bottled. I don't have any bottled and bonds here right now because we drink drank them. them all. Um, but there's some really good ones out there that are just, whew, they're so good. But anyway, um, on to different things with bourbon. You'll see things like single barrel. Single barrel supposedly means it came from one specific barrel in the warehouse. Now, I have come to learn that that term actually has no legal meaning and therefore is not necessarily one barrel. Usually in a warehouse, there's a good section and that section might be where they get those barrels from, but it could be six, eight, 10, 20 barrels even, depending on the distillery. We could go on about histories of particular distilleries. Oh yeah, there's some crazy stuff. The <laughs> the master um, distillers that they had there and what their favorite parts were. We're fascinated by history in general. And but when I don't you, want this to be a four-hour When you pair video. that with alcohol and American history and the different nuances that come into play, it's Speaking really fascinating of. to us. So, yeah, we, we can do a whole episode on that. We could do a whole season on this. Yeah, we could. <laughs> And I've actually begged Derica to let me do an episode on whiskey. But here's the thing, and I said in the group that this is a different video. And it's different because this isn't really, oops, this isn't really a product that we do. We don't make whiskey. We drink it almost on a daily basis, but we don't make it. Therefore, is it really a city setting thing? I don't know. If you guys really like this, we'll do a special every once in a while on a certain whiskey or a, a certain concept of whiskey. I'm happy to do that. But there's other channels out there for whiskey lovers that are, well, I dare say, they know more than we do. Maybe. So it appears that we're going to now be trying Knob Creek for you. How do you sit and talk about whiskey without drinking it? Tell us a little bit about Knob Creek, would you, Brian? Knob Creek is one of those that claims to be the single barrel designation. It is 120 proof, which puts it at cask strength, okay? I'm going to explain that term, cask strength, for you. So and it's 60% alcohol? It is 60% alcohol. This is high proof stuff. Um, I actually really like Knob Creek. My absolute favorite cask strength bourbon, I will admit, is Elijah Craig Barrel Strength. The reason why that's not here is because A, I couldn't find any, and B, They've doubled the price of it because it's become popular. Apparently, they won an award. <clears throat> so 
So, my next favorite is Knob Creek. <laughs> anyway, what, what, did it, what they mean by a single barrel, in this case, I believe it's actually several barrels. I could be completely wrong, but it is a select number of barrels. So it is a lower uh, proportion of various barrels put together. But I've had three bottles of this, maybe four. Every bottle's been slightly different. That's the difference with a single barrel. You don't get that consistent flavor profile that come out a little bit different with every season, every vintage. Whereas like if you take a, actually Wild Turkey is a perfect example. Wild Turkey 101. This is a blended whiskey. It's actually bourbon made by the Wild Turkey Distilling Company, but this could have five, ten different years worth of stuff in it in different barrels from different places in their own distillery making that flavor profile taste the same batch after batch after batch. There's nothing wrong or right about either one of those things. I happen to prefer bourbon that's higher strength. We said it had to be 80. This one is 120. This is 101. That's how I like bourbon. Some people really like bourbon that's at like 80, 80 proof. I don't really care for it. Okay. <laughs> We're going to be tasting our um, whiskeys today in Glencairn glasses. The reason why we choose Glencairn as our primary whiskey enjoyment vessel is because if you notice it has a tulip shape vessel and it has a thicker um, bottom which I'm holding it by so that way my body temperature is not affecting the temperature of the whiskey. This is important because it can change the flavor profile in the whiskey. The alcohol evaporates is... out the second this gets opened. It's automatically coming out. Very small quantities. If you heat it up, that happens faster. And then the tulip shape is going to help concentrate the um, aromas. So when you stick your nose in there, now you can smell all that good bourbony. Goodness. If you are not used to drinking bourbon or whiskeys, do not stick your nose all the way in that glass. <laughs> <laughs> Swirl it around, give it a sniff from afar, and get closer and closer. When it burns, back off you've gone too far because if you reason, burn your nose you won't smell anything right, right after and that. the reason why um this has those strong um phenols in it is because mm. it, it is a higher proof beverage and yeah. so it's going this to have that burny sensation and that's just the if alcohol. you're not used to it it doesn't burn me at all <laughs> but beyond that I'm getting a lovely butterscotch caramel. Butterscotch caramel. Oh yeah, that is primarily what I'm getting from it. A little bit of honey in there. Um, toffee, toffee. Even like a a cookie kind of thing. Like oh a shortbread yeah, cookie. like a yeah sugary this, buttery. This cookie. is what we do. We love this. We we find a bourbon or a whiskey and we smell it and you. And if you talk, you can actually convince your partner of the flavors that you're, you're the smelling The interesting too. thing that is happening when you're smelling this is that your nose is creating, is collecting that information and it is sending it to your brain. And then your brain it's trying to make sense is of trying it. to put words to what, memories. to what that smell is so it can define it. So if you have a memory that's associated with a smell similar to this, your brain is going to say, Grandma! And you're going to be like, why Why does this smell like grandma to Maybe me? Maybe grandma drank a lot of bourbon. Grandma liked a lot of bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, grandma. Um, so that's, that was true? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. I didn't know that. Okay, the whiskey glasses that we have. Yeah. Oh, those, those are... Those are my grandma's. Awesome. Um, a couple of things about bourbon, too. Um, actually, you know what? Here. Let's go. Slancha. It's like candy. So, initially, you want to take a cleansing um, a drink, mm -hmm. especially Don't with the higher it. proof stuff, and then that accumulates your your senses Acclimates. to thank you that word um, to the alcohol. So then your next drink oh that one I got the oak totally got oak off of that. A lot of caramel. And you can hear it. This is high proof stuff. I drink a lot of bourbon and this one is still, it hits you pretty good. So I just now swallowed that. Brian She's daring. Swallowed it right away. Um, it didn't burn me because I had already taken that first drink so the alcohol yeah. wasn't going to affect me anymore. 
And if you noticed, I moved my mouth. I did kind of a chewing motion. Um, some people call this the whiskey chew. I don't know. Um, it's just to help coat your palate so you get all the sensations of the whiskey. This has dimension. It's not a single note with um, bourbon at all. No, it's, it's, it's um, quite complex. It has candy. It has mouthfeel similar to a mead. So it has that velvety yeah. honey feel. Yeah, it's rich. Um, it's not watery at all. But you can definitely taste the wood in there. The the aging in the oak does make a difference. And, and I think it's all those variances that are accompanied in whiskeys that makes it so enjoyable for us. Is that it's it's not just a, Meh, here's its flavor. It's, no, there's beginnings and there's middles and there's mm -hmm. finishes and there's there's aromas. Like... My favorite thing to do with whiskey, surprisingly enough, is not to drink it. Oh, I smell it. It's to smell it. I could sit here and smell this for you hours. Glass. And it, it just makes amazing. me happy. Um, I do that with scotch. It's it's kind of silly, but I urge you, if you do enjoy whiskey, to to fully enjoy it Explore and not it. and not just chug it. When I, when I see people doing shots of whiskey, it hurts me. Yeah. I'm just like. What are you doing? Even the cheapest of whiskeys deserve a little exploration. Yeah, you you want to keep it in your mouth for a while. You want to enjoy it. You want to smell it. You want to look at it. You you don't want to just chug it because that's not what this is about. Something I wanted to say. There are a couple of different uh, bourbons that I really like. This one, and I mentioned the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. I like their small batch as well, but I actually prefer the Barrel Proof. The main difference is from this one to the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof is, in all honesty, this one has much more alcohol burn. Much more. It's much yeah. more burning. The and Elijah Craig, you won't think it's 120 plus proof. It's actually higher proof than this one. It but you won't is know it. delightful. It really is. And that's why it won awards, and that's why, you know, everybody's buying it now, so it's going up in price. Um, Price-wise, <clears throat> it's going to vary everywhere you go. In our area, Knob Creek 120 is about 45 bucks. Um, I get a 1.75 liter of wild turkey for like 30 bucks. And what we're going to do with this, or what we're going to attempt to do, is talk about our favorites, but then talk about alternatives that mm -hmm. might be in a, a more friendly price range. Right. Um, wild turkey 101, not any other type of wild turkey. Yeah. 101. It has to be 101. To me, it's this is the most underrated oh, yeah. whiskey. Yeah. End of statement. And I know I'm probably going to get some hate messages in the comments. Well, they can hate me too because that's what all um, I've been drinking for a week. But seriously, if you haven't had a chance where it's been a while for you to taste Wild Turkey 101, mm. give it a try. Smell it. Um, taste it. Enjoy it. Don't just chug it. Yeah, don't it's put, actually got a lot more And please, for don't put Coca-Cola or Pepsi <laughs> in with it. Just enjoy the beverage as That's it funny. is. And tell me how much you hate it then. Because By the way, enjoy our clear speak now because it's probably going to get a little bit interesting <laughs> as we go. But yeah, that's that's the basics on bourbon. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is American whiskey. Now, basically, American whiskey is bourbon that didn't qualify as bourbon. That's the easiest way to say it. But in most cases, they weren't actually trying to be bourbon. They wanted something different. They wanted a little more flexibility with their mash and with their style. There is one company... Yeah, I was getting to that. ...that totally is a bourbon... Well, they claim they're not. But markets themselves not. And that's simply for marketing to make it's, money. It's Jack Daniels. <laughs> they say that old number seven, whatever they want to call it, is American whiskey. And they're right. But so is bourbon. Bourbon is also American whiskey. That's the thing. They're all just subcategories within their thing. Jack Daniels is made in the bourbon style. They do all those things. They do one extra step, which is a charcoal filtering at the end, and they claim that that invalidates them from being bourbon. I've never actually heard that that invalidates them. It just makes them slightly different, and they don't want to be bourbon. They'd rather be Tennessee whiskey. 
I don't really have a problem with that. Nope. But if you taste a bourbon and you taste Jack Daniels, they're going to taste incredibly similar because essentially they are the same thing. I don't know the real details of their mash bill, but I do know that they're over 51% corn, unless I am mistaken on that. There's some other variations um, Let me go with, within the bourbon grouping that we found we either like or don't like. There are some mash bills that have a higher percentage Ooh. of corn. Pure corn. We are not fans of that. I'm not going to call out names. We're not going to point fingers, and we're not going to say nasty things, because that's rude and inconsiderate. Oh, baby, there are some that I just don't like. What we've termed when we have a strong corn <laughs> beverage is that it's got the corn funk. Yeah. There is just something very peculiar about it that neither one of us yeah. finds appealing. Another thing in the bourbon category is rice. Uh, they're not bourbon. They're not bourbon. They must be just they're, whiskeys, they're whiskey. But it's an American thing. Yeah, it's more American. <clears throat> um, rice, I happen to like because they tend they're to spicy. have a peppery note. And if you watch our channel and you know about my affinity with black pepper, go team! To qualify as a rye, it must be 51% rye versus 51 percent corn now a lot of bourbons have rye in them like you might hear of a high rye bourbon it's still got 51 percent corn but it might be 49 percent rye um, to be a rye usually they're 51 percent rye and they're mixed with corn barley other grains because otherwise rye gets very spicy and just feels hot when you drink it and it just gets to be too much the third american whiskey thing i want to talk about is a weeded whiskey we both mm -hmm. really enjoy the weeded whiskeys. Um, some examples of that would be... Wild Turkey. Wild Turkey. <laughs> Elijah Craig. Yes. Um, doesn't Evan Williams... Evan Williams. Yeah. yeah. Evan Williams is another really seriously underrated whiskey, but it's like... Everybody calls Jack Daniels the cheap whiskey, which I actually think it's pretty good stuff. I don't mind it at all. I sure. like it. Elijah Craig is even cheaper than Jack Daniels, but in my opinion, it's a I don't like their specialty stuff, though. The uh, Evan Williams single barrels and their special editions. Oh, I wasn't yeah. just, that crazy just about them. Just the straight up Just Evan their Williams. straight up Evan Williams is it's wonderful. It's very affordable and it has a lovely t taste. I like Wild Turkey 101 a little better, though. It's a little yeah. more high rye. It's got a little spice to it. Yeah. And it just, it, it tastes really good. And it's surprisingly smooth. Yeah. Um for its alcohol percentage. We're gonna pause here for a second while I rinse these out. Okay, so that since we've been talking about it so much, we're gonna try oh, a little wild turkey. <laughs> well, now that we just had the Knob Creek, sure. let's do a little wild sure. turkey next to it. And I should have filled yours first. That's just in for me. It is okay. If you are interested in our Glencairn glasses, I do have these included in our City Studying Amazon store. You can find that in the links below. Okay, first impression, the smell is not as strong. It's not as strong, and so I'm getting more sweetness in the yep, scent. Yep, But almost everything else is there except there's that spicy note. Almost like a cinnamon. Not yeah. quite. It's, it's even a... All spice? It's fall spices. Yeah. I'm getting a lot of it. Yeah. Like what you'd put in pumpkin pies and spice yeah. cakes and stuff like yeah. that. Might be a combination of anise and... Now, something to understand. None of those things are actually in this. No. <laughs> Not one. That's your brain trying to interpret what it's smelling and put yeah. it into a memory that you have, an experience that you have, so that you can actually taste it. Let's go. Slancha. We're going to crack these. Right off the bat, it's watery compared to Knob Creek. Not to, me, to say that's it's wonderful bad. because I don't have to take that initial yeah. taste. Knob Creek is powerful stuff. It'll, I can, it'll burn. I can enjoy this immediately, mm -hmm. but it's still 101 proof. Oh yeah, this is not weak. It's not so, watery. It's just watery compared to Knob Creek. It's got that sweetness, but it does have a stronger spice note than the Knob Creek does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a higher rye. Yep. mash bill than it than the uh, knob creek is the knob creek i think had a stronger caramel note yes most definitely where, where caramel this one's, and biscuits this one's more sugar and spice combo for me i agree okay 
We talked about American whiskeys and Michter's uh, US 101. Make, they make a rye and they also make a bourbon. I've not had those, um, but I've heard good things. But the small batch unblended American whiskey, I actually really, really like. This would be an alternative to say like a Jack Daniels, okay? It's very similar to a bourbon, but it's not quite a bourbon. And uh, as soon as she's done with that, I'm gonna rinse our glasses. We're gonna have a little bit of this too. So you're probably wondering, what's the main differences? Well, if I read up on this guy, um, doesn't really give a lot. They just say grains and white oak, bourbon soaked white oak barrels. Okay, this is an example of how the whiskeys are starting to integrate into each other. This whiskey is not oaked in new barrels, it's oaked in already used bourbon barrels. There's another whiskey that does that, scotch, which I think is funny because scotch has been around longer than bourbon. Yet, according to Scottish law, it must be aged in ex bourbon barrels. Figure that one out. Yeah. That's a relatively new rule. That's a, which one came first, the chicken or the egg kind of deal? So, this is basically. It's not bourbon. Bourbon is, it's, is a unique flavor profile in whiskey. This is whiskey. This smells so much different than these other two. This, could, this is American scotch. It's not scotch because it's not made in Scotland. Right. But it's the same thing. Right. It's probably a high barley bill, which scotch, uh, we'll get into it, but scotch is all barley. This could be a mix of grains. And they said grains, which makes me think there's multiple. And then it's aged in ex bourbon barrels. In the aroma, I'm getting more of the wood um, oh, aroma. This, yeah, this is totally different. A lot more wood. It's almost like caramel, slightly burnt caramel. Not burnt so bad that no. you get that really nasty. No. But there's there's a charred caramel. There's it's a like smoked. If you were eating caramel <sighs> yeah. next to the campfire or something. That kind but of it's deal. not smoky. It's so not much. smoky, but it's like burning wood kind of. Yeah. Which. And what's the proof on this? I don't even know. Oh, this is forty one percent, forty one point seven percent alcohol. So this is eighty three proof, just barely above the legal limit to be called whiskey in the U S. But I'm the. Like I said before, the it's ar nice though. aroma of this is so much different than these. Ooh. It, to me, it tastes like a cross between an Irish and a Scotch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I've, I've always liked this one. I'm getting the saltiness that I normally find in Scotches. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, this is, this is an awesome whiskey. And it's not crazy expensive. I think it's like 40 bucks or 45 bucks for the bottle. Um... I was wrong when I said this would be like compared to Jack Daniels. No, not even close. Jack Daniels is more bourbon. This is very much sco a Scotch style whiskey. I just haven't had it in a while. I forgot. But yeah, this is good. The when it first goes in, it, I get a little bit more watery than some. Yeah, but it it has a note in it that my brain keeps on wanting to say is a thickness. Yeah. But it doesn't have the same mouthfeel. It's not velvety, so it's but not... it has a rich flavor to it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. Got to drink up. <laughs> Be right back. All right, so we're going to go into our next category, which is Irish whiskey. Near and dear to my heart. Um, we've all had Jameson, which is a perfectly fine Irish whiskey. But before we get to different types of Irish whiskey, we're going to talk a little bit about the Irish whiskey category. Okay. Irish whiskey is... Very, very precise in its methodology, but also pretty open-ended. They can use a pretty a lot of different variety of of um, malts that they put in, different grains and things. But usually, it's a barley malt. It's it, it it's got that. There might be a little corn in some and things like that. They've been changing over the years. The biggest things that make Irish whiskey special is first, it can only be made in Ireland, which is der. Um, and second, it's triple distilled in most cases. What that means is instead of just running it through the distillation process once, they take that distillate and they might mix a little bit of the heads and tails again and then run it through again and then they do that again and then they run it through again. And that's a proprietary process. Each distillery has their own way of doing it and they will probably kill you if you try to find out how they did it. That's the Irish for you. What can I say? But what that does is it makes a very specific, very pure product. Not always high proof. It's not about 
raising the alcohol, it's about making that flavor profile as pure as possible. They also use a pot still, which easiest way to just show a pot still versus a column still, which is the other, is if you look at this bottle, see how it's short, fat, and stubby and goes up into a narrow neck? And then you look at this bottle, if we cut, a, cut off the top, see how it just kind of goes straight up? A column still is really tall and narrow, where a pot still is short and fat and squat. And, well, the Irish have been known to, when they get a new still, they go and they take the old still and find every dent and ding, and with a hammer or whatever tool, make those same marks on that still, because it's believed that the way the vapors run through it changes the flavor profile. Right or wrong? I don't know. That's how they do it. And whiskey is that way. It's a very traditional thing that has been done the same way. You don't change things. Um, but anyway, we've all had Jameson, probably. You know, it's probably one, one of the more popular types of Irish whiskeys. I like Jameson. I don't love Jameson. I think it's a fine whiskey. I think their black is actually pretty good. So flavor profiles for bourbon and American whiskey tend to be caramel, um, vanilla. vanilla, and then that, that alcohol punch. Irish whiskeys tend to be what many people would term as a more friendlier yeah. beverage. They biscuity, sweeter, biscuity, honey. floral, very floral. Um, it's it's a lovely, more delicate in general. Yeah. Um, flavor profile. If you have a friend that wants to get into whiskey, or you yourself want to get into whiskey, and you're afraid, try Irish first. It's probably going to be the most um, I, I do not like to ever say a beginner or advanced whiskey because I think that's You're going to have to bleep yourself again. Whatever. The reason why we're both very adamant about there's no such thing as a beginner whiskey is that I love raw oysters. I don't. Would you say that's a beginner food or not a beginner food? It's a food. Because I was eating raw oysters at a very <laughs> yeah. young age. Like, five? <laughs> so, to oh, yeah. say that a scotch, like a Ardbeg or Laphroaig, is don't drink that for their first drink. Yeah. What if you're really fond of smoky yeah, stuff? Like yeah, the whole beginner thing you is might different. Have, you might have started with an Irish and gone, oh, this is just The reason why I say boring. Irish is because it's probably the most um, approachable. The only thing that I would say is to, so to direct you to an Irish versus a Scotch or a bourbon is that if it's, if it's the alcohol part that puts you off, like Savvy with her jaw where yeah. she says the alcohol makes Savvy it doesn't hurt, like whiskey. then I think she may appreciate an Irish whis whiskey True. far before she would appreciate something like Ardbeg or Wild Turkey 101. Hmm. All right. So we are drinking... Teeling. Teeling. Teeling is my favorite Irish whiskey. Green Spot would be the next favorite. Um, Teeling is a, a, an older brand. They've been around forever. Yeah, the aroma I'm getting is floral. Light, floral, it's, biscuity. It, it's reminding me almost of perfume, but it's not mm -hmm. It's not that real heady, disgusting perfume because I'm not really a fan of over girly perfume. If you were to smell girl, this and s smell any of the other three things we just had, you would swear they were not the same thing. Right. They're all whiskey. They're just made completely different ways. The fact that Irish whiskey is triple distilled like that is very important because it changes things. Most are single or double distilled. To be triple is like super pure, very, very clean. Um, there's not a lot of, I hate to say it, there's not a lot of complexity. Usually there are four or five notes and that's about it. But smelling it makes me really happy. But yeah, smelling the bourbon made me really happy because I'm getting floral and I have a tigger you have a tigger we didn't even slunch and this is Irish what no. the heck sorry too late now I already drank it denied we just skipped on that McDurst too this is a really nice sipping whiskey um, it's also great in uh, cocktails and stuff like that I tend to not really do a lot of whiskey co cocktails other than I like the old-fashioned every now and then what I really like is a whiskey sour I do not get alcohol from this at all until the finish. Mm -hmm. When it's in my mouth, it's I'm getting warming. this nice, 
sweetness. I'm still getting the floral sensation in the flavor as well. I'm thinking more of like... It's heady is what it is. Almost like orange blossom, but not heavy on the citrus. More on the, the blossom part. Um, it's just really it's enjoyable. And then when you swallow, you're like, whoa, that was alcohol. <laughs> Which is kind of funny because now this, you this would think one, you'd get it. This is actually mouth. aged in rum cask. I didn't know that. Oh. Yeah, see what you learn by reading the bottle? And this is 92%, or 92 proof, I'm sorry, 46% alcohol. So it's above the, the minimum. Most whiskeys that you'll find, the better ones, I hate to say better ones, but the ones that are a little different than just your average run of the mill are usually in the like 43 to 90 percent or 86 to 90 proof range. Yes, we are really drinking whiskey. <laughs> um, yeah, 43 to 50 percent is pretty normal. Um, when you get above 50, usually that's in the cask strength kind of range, um, which gets harder and harder to do in Irish and in. Um, Scotch, you don't see a lot of cask strength stuff. <sighs> this is nice though. I like it. Price? Price point on teething. Like 60 bucks. It's not cheap. It's not it's not an expensive one. Green spot would be the next one down. That's again still like 50 bucks though. To me, Irish whiskey is a little bit pricier um, than your others, just because it's it's a little more refined. It takes a little more time to make and a little more expertise. Um, but there's a lot of them out there, and I mean, even if you just got Jameson, it's pretty indicative. Is Redbreast an Irish? Mm -hmm. Redbreast 12 is another now, one. Now, Redbreast is something I have yet to try, mostly because I find it... You had it. You I had it. Yep, I had it at a bar, and you tasted it. I did? Yeah. Yeah, we were both a little inebriated at the time, but yeah. When we were oh, out with Steph, that... Steph and Ben. Oh, okay. Never mind. We had it at an Irish bar, too. Do you want to have some green spot to compare? Uh, yeah. Let me rinse. And there's another show, another YouTube channel that I'm going to give a shout out to. It's Bourbon Night. And they do Cracker Time or something like yeah. that. And it's just yeah. really adorable and really cute. If you really, and, want, if you really do enjoy bourbon, you want to learn yeah. more about bourbon and see different comparisons of other bourbons versus yeah, other bourbons. Yeah, they're like exclusively bourbon and they do a great job. It's, it's another guy and a girl, shockingly enough. Yeah. And they just sit there and talk about bourbon it's pretty awesome so check them out it's bourbon night we should totally get a plug for that <laughs> but anyway so we're gonna have some green spot green spots are relatively i mean it's been around for a while but it's not become famous until like the last few years where people make a big deal about it it's um i like it i don't like it quite as much as teeling and i think it's because it's a little more of a modern flavor profile which is a weird thing to say but teeling to me, is a classic Irish whiskey. This one is a little bit more of a modern Irish whiskey. This one, I'm getting more earthy and grassy yeah. than I am getting floral as I got in the tealing. But it's still very light, very biscuity, yep. very, they're very similar. And that's why I, I, I hate to say I, I love tealing and I just like green spot. It's not really like that. I really like them both. I just like tealing a little bit more. Don't drink. Watch out. Very similar taste though. Maybe slightly lighter. It just doesn't taste quite as strong. I was actually getting um, butter notes up front. Yeah. The very first thing I was getting was butter. Butter is a very common thing in Irish whiskey. Now this is 80 proof, 40% alcohol. That's, a, that's probably why. This coming in at 46% versus 40%, that extra little hit of alcohol can change the flavor profile. And they do different proofs. Not just to say, oh, this one's stronger, that one's weak. It's not like that. The master distiller is blending these together to create a flavor profile. He may feel that 80% was what that whiskey needed. With the teeling, I wasn't getting the alcohol at all until I swallowed. This one is even more subtle. I'm not getting yeah. that, whoa, that was alcohol when I yeah, swallow. The, 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 um, and I actually appreciate that. Yeah, the floral aromas on these and the flavors even really put the alcohol to the back burner. It really just takes it down. Making them more approachable to people who aren't used to high proof alcohols, okay? Like if you like gin, you probably could take Irish whiskey and go, yeah, this is great, I love it. Savvy? Try some green spot, you might <laughs> like it. Yeah, let me rinse, be right back. Now, we are moving on 
to <laughs> arguably <Good stuff> our <laughs> favorite area of whiskey. While and I open these. That would be scotch. While I open these, I'm going to talk a little bit about scotch. Mm -hmm. Scotch is <laughs> almost as varied as whiskey itself. Mm -hmm. It all comes from Scotland. That is the defining characteristic in scotch. The number one defining characteristic. All Sc In order to be scotch, it must come from Scotland. Okay? It also has to be all barley, all malt. Um, and it must come, or it must be aged in uh, ex bourbon casks. Now, some things that you'll hear in Scotch: two overall types, and that is a single malt and a blend. I'm going to dispel a myth here. They're both blends. There's no such thing as truly one barrel, one distillery, one year put into a bottle. They don't do that. Okay? This is monkey shoulder. This is a blend. It is a combination of different scotches from different distilleries, distilleries. put together in, years. in a specific manner to make this flavor profile. Uh -huh. A single malt, you have to understand, the single malt, single is not the descriptor of the malt. It's single and malt. They should say a single comma malt. That would be more accurate because the single part means a single distillery. Like in this one, it's Glen Fodry. Over here, it's Ardbeg. Only that distillery's product can be in here. Malt merely means 100% malt barley. Okay? That's what those two things mean. It does not mean one barrel. It does not mean one year. They can have a 30, 50 different barrels worth of stuff mixed in to make a single malt. If it a has lot of people an get this age wrong. statement listed, that means the youngest yes. barrel is at least that age statement. Like this is a 12 year whiskey. The youngest whiskey put in this blend and this single malt is 12 years old. There could be a 35 year whiskey in here. Maybe it's two drops of it but it's enough that they got that flavor profile. The next year when things came out just a little bit different, they might have to add more or less of various things to get those flavor profiles. So they keep barrels and casks from previous years to be able to blend in, to keep that tasting the same from year to year. A blend... Does that mean a single malt is superior to a blend? No. Only if you feel that that distillery is superior to all the other distilleries put together. I'm not a big, must be single malt guy. I don't believe in that. Do I like single malt? Yes, Absolutely. but I like them because of how they taste, not because of their being snooty. To me, this is a phenomenal blend. This is a fantastic blend. I got no problems with those. Um, by the way, we're gonna talk about Glen Fodry for a second. This is one of those whiskeys that you've probably never heard of. It's not very common. We found it one time and I just said, hey, let's give it a try. We have this thing that we like to do for fun and it's called the blind taste test. Mm. And what we do is we take a selection of different alcohol percentages in a specific range. So we'll do like all bourbons or all mm -hmm. ryes or all a specific type of scotch, which Brian hasn't touched on yet. Glen Fodry is a type of scotch known as Speyside. a Speyside. These me, are regional distinctions. While we're there, can I talk about the regional distinctions? Yes, okay. please. Speyside is a very specific regional distinction of another regional distinction, okay? Basically, in Scotland, you have different regions for producing scotch. You have highlands, which includes spay sites. This is anything near the Spay River or on the side of the Spay, Spay side. You have highlands, which are in the northern part, and they are like Glenlivet, Glenmorangie, um, all those kind of common names you've probably heard. I mean, Glenlivet and Glenmorangie are probably the two most common Scotch brand. I think they are. Glenlivet is the most common Scotch brand sold worldwide. Okay, yeah. they are a Highland Scotch. Now, all Spay sides are Highlands. Not all Highlands are Spay sides. But all space sides and all highlands are scotch. Ta-da! It's the set subset thing. Yeah. You also have Isla and Island whiskeys. There's also 
Um, there's even more subsets there, within the islands. You have the different ones. I'm not going to get into that. I don't have any island whiskeys here today, but like Brooklotic is actually an island whiskey. No, oh, they're Isla. What am I saying? Uh, Campbelltown yeah. is an island whiskey. I think they're the only island whiskey. I don't know. But then there's Jura and things like that. Yes. But anyway, um, the ones that we're going to talk about on the other side are the Isla whiskeys. Now, if you ever hear somebody say an Islay, correct them. It's, it's Isla. Isla. Um, yeah, it's Isla. I-S-L-A-Y. And it's a region of Scotland. They are known for their peaty, smoky, strong whiskeys. Not, not strong in the alcohol sense, strong as in the flavor sense. If you've ever had someone say, I can't go near scotch, the smell kills me. They're talking about an island. It is. Yep. And they just don't appreciate it. I would do the kapow thing, but I have a bunch of bottles here that I like, so I'm not going to do that. But yeah, <laughs> they, they do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so we're going to talk about the Glen Fodry and the Monkey Shoulder. Now, the main difference is Glen Fodry is a single malt, and this is a blend. They're both really good. They're both excellent, and they're both about the same price. We're going to start with some Glen Fodry. Now, she talked about the blind taste test. In the blind taste test, when we tried like six different Highlands, this one to both of us was like, oh, wow, that's awesome. It's so much stronger in flavor. In the Scotch realm, I prefer Speysides. And people are going to be like, oh, you're being such a girl. Uh, no. Still Scotch. Because guess what? I love this stuff too. <laughs> so, <laughs> But... Speysides are my favorite. Um, they're more floral. They're more fruity. Butterscotch. They're more candy. Caramel. And what is to not like Biscuit. about those things? Butter. Butter. So my go-to Speyside Scotch. Buttered toast. Forever was Glenmorangie. Yeah. I was all about the Glenmorangie. And normally when we do the blind okay. taste tests... I'm setting up the test and writing all the notes and stuff, and Brian is doing the tasting, and it, he's the one that's judging it. And so we did, like, three or five, I don't know how many different bourbon taste tests. Oh, God, like, yeah. And fun. every single time, Elijah Craig. Elijah Craig was numero uno. Number two was always Knob Creek. Yeah. Number three was Booker's. Yep. And then he turned the Booker's finish, and, and that's a whole other Which topic. Is a bitter so finish, we'll yeah, get into that in But just for kicks, we decided rather recently, actually, to do a blind taste test for the both of us yeah. on... Highlands. The um, Speyside... No, oh, we did... It was Highlands. It was Highlands, but it was mostly Speyside. Mostly Speyside. Um, scotches. And this one, for both of us... Hands, Highest mark. Hands down, one. I was shocked. It's so surprising. It broke my heart. Glen Morangie didn't. It was like all the other ones three, tasted think, watery I mean. compared to this. But Glen Fodry, you're doing something right. Glen Morangie, out of the six, I think was like number five for her. Yeah. This one is just it's it's so such a strong smelling. Smell. This you get the salt, you get some iodine in there. Really. Yeah, compared to these, it's not candy at all. It's it's <laughs> all I get is butterscotch butter. <laughs> Biscuits. You definitely get the butter. It's like a strong Irish whiskey to me. But it's got that, like I can feel it in the front of my See, here's the problem. Palette. I drink stuff like this. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get, <laughs> we're, we're, we're saving that know, one we're saving it. to the end for reasons. Yeah. Very right. important reasons. Click, click. It's cool. Powerful stuff. Not, going not knock in, you on your butt. It's just got so much flavor. Going in is like sweet salt, sweet salt, sweet salt, yep. sweet salt. And then you get this. Little alcohol burn. This is like. This is 94.2, 94.2 proof, by the way. So this is not, this is not weak. It's actually got some kick. It's almost. I get a very warm sensation. Yeah, but I'm it's almost, rich. I'm almost getting like rubber. If I, uh, yeah, my brain is yeah, you can get is some trying to figure things out and oh, that's something we, well, we'll talk about when we get to the eyeless. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I have been joined by Tigger. Yeah, camera cut out. We're back. She's needy, but she despises the scent of alcohol. <laughs> she doesn't like my whiskey at all. All right. So as I was saying, um 
you may find it odd that I use the term rubber for a tasting note. <laughs> and that's because my brain is trying to decipher what is that sensation what and doing? how, what word can I put on that to describe it. And so it feels like it has substance, though it's a liquid and it doesn't really have substance. It feels like it has a flavor profile that is slightly artificial, but not in a bad way, if that makes any sense. And I think that's where the salt comes in. Rubber and Band-Aids are commonly yes. used to describe scotch. But for, not in a bad way, just you got to appreciate those kind of things. But I'm not, I'm not getting the Band-Aid rubber, I'm just getting more of a pure rubber, which... Sure, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. But primarily I'm getting sweet and salt. And like they're very distinct and so they, like, they kind of shift back and forth as I'm drinking it, which is a really interesting sensation. Finish that up. We got monkey shoulder. Be right back. But beyond that, it does have that taffy. And I'm thinking maybe that's where I'm getting the rubber from. Because the sensation of taffy, when you eat saltwater taffy, it has that kind of chewy, rubbery texture. And even though I'm not getting that texture from a beverage, obviously, my brain is making that connection. Monkey Shoulder. Now, Monkey Shoulder is a space side blend. Some people say they get smoke off of it. I'm gonna disagree. I don't believe there's any peated, smoky whiskey in this at all. But it's a common thing to get these flavors in scotch, just in general. Um, when we get to the Isla, I'm going to explain what peat is mm -hmm. and what it's not. Notice the pores are getting smaller. Yeah, this smells completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a lot more candy. This is a lot more... Um, but I'm also getting the wood scent in it yeah, again. Yeah, I get some heavy wood aging in it. Yeah. I don't know what the blends are that are in this. Um, a lot of them are proprietary, they won't tell you. And they could be distilleries that you've never even heard of because the distillery only exists to make blended whiskeys. They might not make their own version of a single malt. Um, this Monkey Shoulder is a really nice whiskey, very easy to find. It's like 30 bucks for a bottle. Yeah, I think. it's not. Glen hey, Fodry. Ticks, not, yeah. not now. We're having the battle of the window again. Eh, let her climb in there, she can stay. If it was falling the way. Um, what? <laughs> okay, Glen Fodry is not really expensive. It's like $38, $39 a bottle, $40, bucks, something like that. It might be harder to find. Um, we have Total Wine and more here that actually seems to have a really good selection. Um, they have it, but yet ABC Liquors does not, and other liquor stores don't. So it might be sort of a proprietary thing. I don't know, but it's really awesome. Monkey Shoulder is really common. So Monkey Shoulder, for me... I went ahead and took a drink while he was talking. I may have jumped the gun. It's okay. I am sorry. I'm getting the sweetness right up front. I'm not getting the sweet yeah, salt really sweet. fight. It's just sweet. And then it goes into... It's waterier to me. Yeah. I get a tiny, tiny tinge of alcohol bite. Mm -hmm. But not much. What is this? It's probably... 80. And I'm getting... I don't know. This is 86 proof. I'm getting more of the taffy where it's reading taffy rather mm. than rubber. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now there's something interesting to talk about at this point when when we're talking about the tasty notes and all the different comparisons is that there are so many things that are going to affect your tasting notes that you oh, may drink yeah. the same beverage three different days and get completely different tasting notes each day. It's gonna deal a lot with what you ate just before, what you drank just before. We drank a sample of all of these. Yeah, we actually messed up. We should have we started here. with Irish. Yeah, but you know, whatever. Um, Irish would be the easiest mm -hmm. profile, then bourbon, then your Highland Scotch, then your Isle Scotch. Your mood can affect it because remember, this is your brain trying to come up with words. So if you are all sorts of angry, and you taste something, it might just be like, nah, that's a bulldog or, I don't know, something. And over time, too, you get really good at the different flavors that are in there. Like, we're talking a, a lot of different things. 
I, I don't do a lot of tasting in the last six months. We just haven't had time. But we used to do it all the time, and I got really good. I could pick out this whiskey, that whiskey, that whiskey. Now, I can probably tell between the Islas, because I'm pretty good with those. Now, and bourbons, maybe. Now that I'm sitting here and I'm, I keep swallowing, I'm getting a maple syrup note. Oh, yeah. Which I normally find the most strongly in Canadian whiskeys. Yeah. Which, unfortunately... Which is ironic, because there's no maple syrup in them. Right. <laughs> which is kind of funny, because you think Canada maple syrup, and then... They don't actually use maple syrup, but you get that profile from it. Oh, speaking of Canadian whiskeys, we didn't include Canadian in this, just like we didn't include Japanese. Japanese, because we don't have any. Um, they tend to be a little drier than your scotches, but they're made in a scotch tradition. They're actually very yeah, similar. Yeah, I wrote some notes. Yeah, we have some notes on those. They're usually double malted or peated barley aged in wooden cask, tends to be drier and smokier, and comes as a single malt or blend. The Japanese that I had, I don't remember what it was. It was a Hibiki something. I wasn't that crazy about it. I have to admit, it was a while ago, but I wasn't crazy about it. Japan is relatively new to the whiskey scene, so... They're very disciplined. So they're very, um... I hate to use the word, but trendy right now. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, it's the new thing. Mm -hmm. um, and their bottles are really pretty because they do beautiful calligraphy on their labeling. What I understand is they're very consistent batch to batch, and their standards are very, very high. So they're using the best ingredients, the best methods. They're actually copying a lot of the Scotch stuff. There's a couple of Japanese makers that are actually, that actually hired Scotch distillers to work for them. Okay, so it's essentially the same thing. It's just Japanese-made Scotch. Yep. Nothing wrong with it. I just, you know, if, I'm gonna want, if I want scotch, I'm going to get scotch. That's just me. Um, Canadian. Here's why we don't have Canadian on the list. All the good Canadian whiskeys aren't available in the United States. What the heck, Canada? You're saving it all for yourself! I mean, is Crown Royal bad? No, it's really not. I actually kind of like Crown. By the way, Crown Royal is whiskey, for those of you that don't think it is. Yeah. I've actually heard people say, oh, I want a Crown of Coke. I'm like, oh, yeah, is Crown your favorite whiskey? What? I'm not that's drinking not whiskey. whiskey. I don't drink whiskey. Whiskey's awful. Now, some of you will say, oh, that's water and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know what? Let's put all joking aside. It's 80 proof. It's 40% alcohol. It's the same as Jack Daniels. Sorry. So it's there. whiskey. Um, and it's, it's decent whiskey. Is it great whiskey? No. But if I was in a bar and they had that versus four or five other things that I know as rot gut, I'd probably get crowned and I'd be okay with that. Another side note about Canadian whiskey is because we do know they tend to keep the good stuff for themselves and they're north. We're coming for you, Canada. We're going to drink some of your whiskey. I have no idea what she means by that. Probably the whiskey talk. Let me go right spear. Before we move on to arguably the best kind of whiskey out there, also known as my favorite, also known as Isla. I want to talk about how to drink whiskey. So far, we've only been drinking it neat. You can add a little bit of water if you like to. That tends to open things up. And because they've been in casks for so long, that little bit brings the oils to the surface, will make a, a, a rich whiskey a little bit richer for a couple Please of days. Please do not think that if you add a little bit of water to a whiskey that you're going to water it down. That is not the case. By the way, when we say a little bit, we're saying if you have it filled this much and you put a few drops. few drops. Literally just a few drops is all it takes. The reason why you would want to do, do this is because there are things called water-soluble oils, mm -hmm. which are found in alcohol. Phenols. And if you add a little bit of water, they open up. Yep. They don't water down. They yeah. get empowered. And oil and water don't so, mix, so it'll push those oils so to the So they're surface. going to strengthen the yeah. taste and the sensation. They're not going yeah, to water it down. Yeah, most of the that first taste is a lot more powerful if you added a little bit of water. I tend to not do it. It's just a personal preference. I tend to not do it. Another way to drink whiskey is on the rocks. Now, that's my preferred way. Go ahead. Hate me all you want. But I take a nice big glass, I put an ice ball in there. Yeah, he doesn't use these glasses. We have specific glasses that will fit the giant ice ball. And about three ounces of whiskey. And the reason why he uses the ice ball is because his drink, over time, with the melting of the ice, will change. So he can enjoy a variety of complex notes from the same beverage just yeah. by letting it sit in his glass Remember for a I while. Remember I said I like high-proof bourbon? The first sip actually gives me goosebumps most like, of the time. Ooh. It's like, whoa! 
The second sip, a couple minutes later, now it's smoother. By the time that ice ball is down to half size, I'm drinking candy. It's just doesn't even taste like alcohol anymore. I'm probably down to like 20% alcohol at that point. But it still, it changes the, the experience the whole way through. Also, why do I put it on ice? I live in Florida. It's hot. Our winters are 55 degrees. If ice we're is lucky. nice. <laughs> I'm actually from northeastern Pennsylvania, okay? Dunmore, little teeny tiny town if you've ever heard it. Probably haven't. It's right next to Scranton. Yeah, I know. The office jokes are coming in. And I may have had a little bit of alcohol, so, you know, just bear with me. But anyway, I, that's where I'm from. And, you know, it's really cold there. So if I lived there still, I might actually drink this neat more often because now it's cold. This will warm you up. I like having a little bit of ice in it. Does it numb my taste buds? Does it take down the flavors a bit? Yes, it absolutely does. But as a result, I drank more flavorsome whiskeys to make up for that. And that just came to me. I hadn't thought of that before, but that actually makes a lot of it sense. It totally makes sense. I do the high proof bourbons, I do the really most flavorful Highlands, and I go for Isla whiskeys. We also do, occasionally, when we're feeling extra spry, make cocktails. Now, Sometimes. you will not ever see us combine any of these delightful beverages with a soda product such as Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Well... Because <laughs> we don't drink those things. I've done it. <laughs> yes. On occasion. But even when he's done it, he's normally used Aldi's oh, yeah, brand it's Aldi's Coke. of soda. Yeah, I don't buy Coca-Cola. I don't believe it. Um, Nobody needs that much phosphoric acid in their diet. Rah! Yeah, don't get us on that topic. Yeah, okay, but we do really enjoy... No idea what you're talking about. Oh, Cointreau. Adding some of that to whiskey. I call this the instant old-fashioned. Half Cointreau, half whiskey of your choice. Boom. Old-fashioned. You don't need to add anything else. If you and are... you will be on your butt for a couple of those. Because <laughs> that is 80 proof. <laughs> if you are not familiar with Contro and you do like the flavor of orange, mm -hmm. then I highly suggest you try it out. Yeah. Oh, you got to add some bitters in order to make it old-fashioned that way, too. But hey, anyway, on to... As we said five minutes ago, arguably the best kind of whiskey out there, the strongest, most definitely, and the most uh, contested and probably hated kind of whiskey out there. That is Isla. Isla is, they make strong stuff. Now, let me explain something right now. The idea of a peated or smoky whiskey. Some people believe that they take peat and dump it into the mash. No, peat is like bog mud basically and what it is is here's here's how it all happened we're going to turn it over to me now because i am the gardener of the two of us and this is a garden but i thing. know this i know you do and i'll turn it right back over to you as soon as i'm done with the Fine. botanical components of peated whiskey i'm pouring some johnny walker in. <laughs> peat is not bog mud as brian was so eloquently stating it is kind actually of the um, moss. decomposing material and the moss material that grows in the decomposing material that makes the spongy matter of bogs. So it is not mud. It is a living organism. It's moss. Was a living organism. It's a combination of both because the moss is still living, okay. but the decomposing. Anyhow. In so the they use that to stop the malting process. What is the malting process? It's when you take the seed What happened to turning it over to of me? the grain, still gardening, hello, and they let it sprout. That's what malting is. Do you but know why? They want to stop that process, and the way they stop that process is by putting the peat underneath it, lighting on fire, and letting that smoke stop it. Now back to Brian. She's right and she's wrong at the same time. First of all, in the areas of Isla, they don't have a lot of trees. So they use peat as a fuel source for burning things back in the day, obviously. Malted barley is what is used to make almost all scotch. Actually, all scotch is malted barley. Malted simply means, as she said, a germinated seed. Now, the reason they germinate it rather than just using straight barley, because as it starts to germinate, it releases an enzyme 
that turns starches into sugars. If you watched our group video, I talked about that a little bit. And that is the basis between in mashing beer. It's, uh, the mashing is doing exactly that. Heated to a certain temperature, it'll happen. So they let it grow just a tiny bit. And as soon as it germinates like that, now they have to stop it immediately at just the right point. To do that easily, they cook it. Basically, they use the smoke and the heat from burning peat to cook it. Well, in doing that, it imparts the flavors of that smoke into the barley, which is then mashed, just like you would do beer, and fermented, and then they take that and they distill it, and that becomes your virgin, if you will, scotch, which is then aged in X bourbon barrels, like we said earlier, and that makes your scotch and that makes it smoky. There so is the smoke, actually no peat in scotch. It's the smoke from the peat that was imparted into the malted barley yep. that was imparted into the distilled beverage. And you have several distilleries. The most famous Isla distilleries are arguably Ardbeg, Lafroig, and Lagavulin. Okay, those are the three big ones. There's others, but those are the three biggest. They each have their own flavor profile because they use peat from bogs around their distilleries, and they are different. <laughs> That's part of where they get it. It's called terroir. It's, it's using what's around you, and um, they're each different. I can actually describe them. Lagavulin is the most sophisticated of the smoke. It's the lightest to me. Some people say it's the strongest. I think it's actually the least of the three. It's got more of a... If you went to a high-end restaurant and they had a fancy fire behind glass, the smell that you would get in that restaurant combined with the rich meats and foods, like say it's a steakhouse, that is Lagavulin smoke. Then you have Lefroig smoke. Lefroig smoke is you are basically sitting on top of a campfire, breathing it in, okay? It's very strong, very in your face, and very raw. It's a very strong smoke. But imagine you're doing that on a beach near a saltwater inlet that's just heavily laden with salt. That's what you get. Ardbeg is my favorite, and that is you're sitting in a leather armchair in front of a potbelly stove that's burning wood. In, a, in an old cottage made of wood, you get that woody, woody smell, the richness of the leather. You, you're still probably somewhere sitting in a, near a salt lick or a salt lake of some kind or a salt ocean, so you're still getting a little bit of that salt. But those are three different kinds of smoke, and they're all within a hundred miles of each other completely different flavor profiles. And yes, you could give me all three and I will tell you which is which. I like Isla's. This that we're drinking now is Johnny Walker Double Black. Now the Double Black is an interesting one. It's usually cheaper. Johnny Walker is a blend. Is that yeah, right? oh yeah, I was getting to that. Johnny Walker is all blends. They don't make their own. They do have um, a few different uh, whiskeys in there. Bamore, I think, is one of the main ones that's in here. Um, there's no Ardbeg in it. I wish there was. Um, there's no Lagavulin, there's no Freud, you know, these, I think they have Brucolic, I, I don't know, they have like eight different blends. This one is like 30 bucks a bottle. There's black and there's double black. The double black has a double hit of peated whiskey in it. I like it for the peated whisk, peated part of it. It's got some nice smoke flavors, but it's not overpowering. This is one of those whiskeys that I say, okay, I want something that'll you know, has some, some complexity to it that I can sit and smell for a while while I'm drinking it, while I relax, I reach for this one. Also, it's reasonably inexpensive for Isla highly peated whiskeys. They tend to get kind of pricey. We had finished our bottle of Ugadol before we came up with this concept for this video, and our dear beloved friend Deborah brought this bottle for us. Careful swirling that around. On, be careful with it. On Deborah Day. I'm not going to hurt the bottle. I know when you swirl it, it'll oxidize. Okay, that's the good stuff. You got to be careful with that. Anyway, thank you, Deborah. Yeah, Deborah brought that for us. Because it's a complete surprise. Ubedo, unfortunately, has become increasingly expensive. Yeah, it's like 90 it. bucks, 100 bucks a bottle. Yeah. It's one of the more expensive whiskeys I've ever had. Um, Lagavulin 16 is arguably the most expensive whiskey I've had. And what's really funny with Lagavulin 16, I heard the hype and it's, oh, it's this, it's that. And I tried it. I got 90% of the way through the bottle and then went, I get it now. I like it. It was like this much <laughs> left in the bottle and I finally got to where I liked it. 
And that's the funny thing with whiskeys. You can try one once and go, oh, I don't like this. Come back a week later, try it again. Oh, that's not bad. Come back a week later and go, I really hate this. Come back a week later. This is the best thing I have ever put in my mouth. Oh, that's going to bite me in here. <laughs> anyway, this is Johnny Walker Double Black. It is a blend of many different distilleries. It's a nice blend. Um, it's relatively inexpensive, like I said. It's a smoky, peated whiskey. It's, it's mostly When you of... smell this, you know this is a different creature yeah, from these, all of these. You can put all these together. These are still different. You get the salt, you mm -hmm. get the smoke, it's right there. Slancha. Sorry, Irish on a Scotch thing, I know. If you are Scottish and you say something different that we have not said yet as a toast, please let us know in the comments. So I'm about that much Scotch, just so, so you know. So, so we can toast appropriately. But I keep increasing that amount because I drink a lot of these. <laughs> This, to me, is the least sweet of all the things that we tasted today. It has the least amount of sugary notes in it of anything. But it has probably the more complex flavor of anything we've had today. I get a little, a little bit of ham and bacon off of it. Um, meaty flavors are not uncommon. I'm getting leather. Oh, yeah. I get leather. I get bacon. I get seawater. I yeah, get campfires. A little bit of campfire. I feel like, I feel like I'm on the beach in front of a bonfire, roasting bacon. Hmm, I wouldn't quite go that far. And there's, drift, yeah. there's driftwood in there for an, an added wood thing. See, to me, this is still kind of, I hate to say that. And word. now I'm getting the Band-Aid. Yeah. I hate to say it, this is kind of weak to me for an Isla. It's a nice whiskey, but it's not, it, it doesn't have that, you know, punch. It just, it, it's just not there. It, it's good. Don't get me wrong. And I like drinking it. I drink probably three times more of this than I do of this, mostly because this is expensive and I'm frugal, as I've said. Um, notice the level of the bottle and the level of the bottle. <laughs> if distilling was legal. Oh my God, we would be making this stuff. This would be a different channel. <laughs> we would be the distilling channel. Actually, we would be the Isla Scott, the, the Florida version of Isla Scotch channel. Sure. We, we've had a significant amount of whiskey so far. <laughs> I'm just going to finish this so we can get to the good stuff. So when I say Band-Aid, and I'm sure those of you who have not experienced this before and are being like, Derek, oh, what the heck? Um, it is that rubbery sensation with some medicinal notes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm almost sensing cotton i i don't know how to explain that that's a new one i've not heard that as a where descriptor. where it's like light and cleansing on top of all the heaviness that's there there's like a little note that's like i'm trying to clean you up but there's well all technically this... it's an antiseptic sure <laughs> it'll kill pretty much anything um but I've never tried to explain what band-aid meant i've always just said band-aid and brian's like oh yeah i get that if you put a band-aid on Leave it there for two, three days, and peel it back and sniff it. That's Band-Aid. <laughs> that sounds gross. That is not what I meant. <laughs> That's what but, it is to me. <laughs> but it's it's the rubber and it's the medicinal. It's the rubbery smell of band -Aids. And, and now I'm, I'm even getting cotton, and I don't even know how to explain cotton. But I've heard somebody else mention cotton before in like a candle scent or flavor mm. scent, like a l linen and cotton. And I'm thinking maybe that's where I'm getting it from. Hmm. Anyway. If I was forced to choose a blend and a single malt of Isla, it would be Johnny Walker Double Black, which to me, bang for your buck, is... Double Black or Black? Double Black. Double Black, okay. Johnny Walker Double Black would be my choice for a budget blend. Uh, best bang for your buck. It's just got a lot of flavor packed into a really inexpensive price. A lot of good whiskeys in here. I couldn't tell you what the years are. They don't really publicize that kind of stuff. It, it is has, 80 proof, so it's the minimum necessary. It has a lot of complexity without that alcohol punch to the base. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, you know, the, the flame in there, the smoke, the leather is all there, the bacon, ham, and, you know, all those rich, meaty flavors. Yeah. They're all there. But it's, Still just a touch downturned. 
compared to a true Isla single malt. So I have to chug the rest of this oh, yeah, so do. we can get to the good stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm just waiting for you to finish that so we can drink the good stuff. We had a sample of this on Deborah Day. I'm gonna have another sample today. Let me go rinse these up. And now! So this has a sherry cast finish, which means that it was really? finished in sherry casts. Typically, we are not overly fond of the sherry cast finish, but of the art bags that we've tried, this is our favorite. And the way I say our favorite is the combined of the two of us like this one the most. Brian is perfectly happy drinking straight up art bag 10. Uh, 10? Or an or. Um, without any issue. I, I can appreciate it. I can appreciate all these things um, to varying degrees. But Oogadol, to me, of By the way, Arbeg collection... I'll just put that there. Is... You, so you can see the spelling of it. My favorite. It said... It's pronounced Oogadol. There is a couple other expressions of... Ardbeg that I really like. Ardbeg 10, which is basically their 10 year single malt, and Enoa, which is their smoky version. Enoa, if you do not like smoky whiskey, don't even bother trying it. It's very smoky, very peaty, but it is unbelievably awesome. We've heard that Compass Box, which is another um, maker, they do blends exclusively. All they do is blends and Peat Monster of their line was supposed to be the ultimate peat expression. We, wah, 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 we do not agree. Wah. I'm sorry Compass like Box. It. Your your ideology is brilliant and beautiful and we do have the orangey which Brian does not drink but I do drink. It's not whiskey. Up there. Um, it's orange flavored whiskey like product. He's going to stop being negative because we're not being negative on this show. That was positive, actually. But, Think of what I could have said. But the <laughs> Anoa version of Ardbeg, it's I'm strong. sorry, it is way it's, peatier it's than not, Monster. It's, and and it wasn't Derek In our opinion. Of the three, it would probably not be the one that I would choose to drink if I wanted to sit and enjoy. If I want to sit and explore a whiskey, Anoa is the one to get. Um, I could smell that one for hours before I even take a taste. And it's people, that kind of thing. You may be watching this and going, you guys are just delving into semantics. I mean, what's the difference between mm. enjoying and exploring? And there is a difference. And yeah. yes, we are being semantic in it, but it there's a point to that. And that's that if you just want to drink just to, oh, I'm drinking and not thinking about it. Choose this one. Choose that one. But if you want, this one. If you want to really think think about it and go yeah. oh wow i'm getting this note i'm getting that note and it's all about complexity this scent, and now it's changed and it's gone to this and that then yeah it's it's worth your your money and your time and your effort to get our bag yeah Ugadal is a very complex very deep flavorful whiskey it's got a lot going for it in my opinion just off of the label in that it's 54 percent alcohol so this is cask strength which brings me back to bourbon. It's also very heavily peated. It's smoky. It's strong. It's bacony. On the label, it actually says treacle, bacon, and bonfires. That's new. They didn't always put that on there. I have the old version of this bottle too, and it doesn't say that. How can you go wrong with treacle, bacon, and bonfires? I mean, seriously. Yeah, for those of you that don't know what treacle is, it's kind of like molasses. Sort of. Kind of. In a way. Anyway. I'm going to smell this and right off it's the most Peeps. complex yeah it's Peeps. got more going for it than anything else here it is a campfire it in a smells glass. like if you had smoke like like something was burning a piece of wood was burning and you captured it and put it in a glass and then you put like a really juicy ham on top of it yeah. so in the middle of all that our camera decided to cut out most likely due to the fact that we went for more than 30 minutes. <laughs> anyway, what I wanted to share about this particular whiskey, the Udall, is as much as we get the bacon and we get the ham and the smoke, this brings back a specific memory for me of my grandfather. And it's, we would go to the cottage every year, and the cottage is like this 
campground basically of old cottages that are uninsulated and you really don't go there in the winter much but we would go every spring just as the frost fr broke and we'd take a swim across the pond which basically was ice covered a week before it's spring fed so you know it's cold right spring fed ponds if you're not familiar with them are cold all the time yeah this is uh northeast pennsylvania so northeast pennsylvania in march we still get snow sometimes anyway after that, we would go back to the cottage, bundle up in blankets. I would sit on his lap in this old leather chair that he had. That I remember the arms. They were like this big, wide, wooden arms with lion heads on the ends. It sounds a little creepy, but it really wasn't. It's just this old chair that was leather. Actually, it sounds awesome, and I wish we inherited that chair, but unfortunately, yeah. it's not. We did, we, yeah, long story. Um, and it was like five feet from this old-fashioned cast iron pot belly stove that always had logs in it that were from aged wood from 50 feet away out back and the smell in this cottage was just this awesome sweet smoke and that combined with the leather of the chair us drying up while we were doing all those things combined that's what i taste and and i'm reminded of when i have Ugadol or any Ardbeg, really. They, they all have the same smoke profile, and it really just brings that back to me. And it's a big deal. Um, in a previous take, Derica said, this is my happy place, is thinking of my grandfather. And she's not wrong. It totally is. And it was nice when she said it. I just had to bring it up now. Um, but it brings me back to that memory. And that's what whiskey does for me. It brings back memories of specific things in a good way. And um, that's what I like about it. What you may or may not can see from your point of view due to all the mass of whiskey bottles is that we have cats climbing all over us right now. I have Tigger all curled up purring away in Which my is lap. really strange. She usually shows that on me. And Jinx is over on Brian right now. So. Showing me his butt. Yes. <laughs> so the cats are feeling our happiness and, and they're appreciating it. And they probably want their food. They probably want their food, but they They're are early because it is only 5.20 right now in our time. Um, so we're going to try to clear this up and finish this video, which has taken far too long, but we knew it would. Because, in summary. Because there's lots of stuff we wanted to tell you. In summary, so bourbon is awesome. Yes. Irish whiskey is good. Yes. Highland scotch is Derek's favorite. Yes. Isla scotch is the bomb. <laughs> you know, I never use that term, mm -hmm. but it was... Yes. So, was the concept for this video is that we were doing this during the holidays for so you. Whiskey. As a gift for you, because we know we've, we've heard so many comments about our interest of our whiskey collection that's yeah. normally here, and now part of it's on the table, um, and that you wanted to, oh. to hear about our knowledge. And yes, we have a ridiculous amount of knowledge of whiskey. Yeah, we lovely. only shared just a sliver of what we know. So I'm going to give some quick advice. If you have a whiskey lover on your Christmas list and you know that they love strong flavored whiskeys, don't be afraid to get them an Ardbeg, an, uh, a Laphroaig, or a, a Lagavulin. If you're not sure, but you know they like whiskey, try Monkey Shoulder. Try the the Glen Fodry. If you can't find Glen Fodry, there's a couple. I mean, Glen Morangy, Glen, Glen Morangy. Those are all good. Yep. If you know they're pure American and only want American stuff, the bourbons, the U.S. Uh, the Michter's whiskey is actually awesome, but also like you know you can't go wrong with the Knob Creek, Elijah Craig, Booker's, Baker's. All those whiskeys are all fantastic, and they're bourbons. If they aren't snobs and they're willing to try, hello. I don't know that that's such a gift to me, though. That's like a standard. Gift it to yourself. Yeah. Do yourself oh, a yeah. favor. Get a get the big one. By the one, way, like scary we fact. We bought this a week ago. There you go. Just say it. If you have a friend who likes scotch or thinks they like scotch, and they're not really sure, or you're not really sure what it is that they like, but you want to impress them, buy the Johnny Walker. It's a very well-known brand, and it's known as a high-end brand. If you have a person who drinks but really doesn't like alcohol punch so much, get them an Irish whiskey. Teeling, green spot. Yep. Can't go wrong. I think that about covers it. I do. If you have questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below. <laughs> Brian has the hiccups now. That's <laughs> yeah. a good sign. Go figure. Um, 
honestly, either one of us can probably answer 99.9% .9 of your questions of any type of whiskey. I know, I was trying to savor it. Um, we really enjoy this stuff. We don't suggest chugging it oh, or no, don't taking do shots. shots of it because that's to us. If I see you doing a shot of whiskey, I'm going to slap you. Yeah, so saying. to us it's insulting. This is mm. something that needs to be savored. It needs to be enjoyed, and that takes time. Um, the best way to drink whiskey is the way you like it. Yeah, we got that from somebody else. But it's true, and we're not going to backstab people like some other people do. We're going to stick to that. I went there. Yes, I did. Um, even if you like it with Coke, by all means... Go ahead and take those carcinogens into your life. I have to be it's honest. It's your choice. I had a smoky Coke, and I liked it. If you're not sure what a smoky Coke is, ask me in the comments. I think we're done. <clears throat> Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. If not, for the simple fact to watch us getting increasingly, increasingly <laughs> intoxicated. Mostly her. Mostly me. Um... Tinker is now asleep in my lap. This has never happened. I'm not really sure why. It's because Jinx was in mine. We'll She's see you jealous. next time. Slightly more cognitive on City Stitting. Have a great day, guys. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. Don't forget, if you want to learn to grow and brew and take control of your food, hit the subscribe icon down below, and don't forget to hit that little bell. That way you get notified of everything we do. And if you really like what we do, Consider becoming a patron. Information in the descriptions of all of our videos. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.